Several companies drop out of a business coalition supporting climate legislation. They say pending bills won't price carbon fairly. Well, does it mean business is backing away from climate change legislation? The U.S. chief climate negotiator responds. And Canada promises to offset the thousands of tons of carbon emissions produced by the Winter Olympics. From the Energy News Center in Washington, D.C., this is the Energy Report with Susan McGinnis. Good morning, I'm Susan McGinnis. Thanks for joining us for the Energy Report on this 17th day of February 2010. Two oil and gas majors are leaving the High Profile Climate Action Partnership. That's the coalition of business and environmental CEOs that produced a blueprint used to draft the Waxman-Markey Climate Bill. BP America and ConocoPhillips say that climate legislation pending in Congress unfairly favors coal over natural gas and would drive their refinery business overseas. They say compromises give coal burners uh, nearly all of the needed allowances for free, reducing incentives to switch to lower emitting natural gas. And they say oil refineries get few of their allowances free, so they're disadvantaged in international competition. Another cap dropout yesterday, Caterpillar. Like the two oil companies, this giant equipment maker says it can pursue climate goals better alone and cited its recent decision to join the Future Gen Clean Coal Project. All three companies stress they still support comprehensive climate legislation that puts a fair price on carbon. But some climate change skeptics pointed to the news of the cap defections as proof that business is backing away from supporting climate change legislation. Well, U.S. Chief Climate Negotiator Todd Stern was asked about that at the State Department yesterday, and he said that is not what he is seeing. Overall, business interest in, and focus on this issue is growing gradually uh, and that that will continue because uh, whatever the ups and downs of this process at any particular moment, there is only one direction that this process can go, which is uh, in the direction of, uh, of action to, uh, to reduce emissions. In the effort to reduce U.S. emissions and create jobs, President Obama has announced the award of the first loan guarantee to a nuclear power company. The administration is giving an $8.3 billion loan guarantee to Southern Company. It's planning two reactors at its Vodal site. That's about 35 miles southeast of Augusta, Georgia. Southern already has a pair of reactors in operation there, but wants to add two more with a combined capacity of 2,200 megawatts. Here's a look at the site itself the company's been clearing land and adding construction infrastructure. But no nuclear construction can begin until NRC approves Southern's license application. Well, after President Obama's announcement, Clean Sky's Tyler Suters talked with the president and CEO of Southern Company and asked David Ratliff if the project would have moved forward even without the federal loan guarantee. We actually work with the state leadership in the state of Georgia, the governor, legislature, the Public Service Commission, most importantly to decide that this technology was the right thing for us to do. So we had already moved forward with the project. What the loan guarantee does is lower the cost of the project for our customers. So it's a very desirable outcome for us because it goes to the benefit of my customers, not to me or not to my stockholders, but to my customers. So you're saying everything financially would have been in place even without this uh, guarantee from the Fed? Well, we were moving through the project, and as we had need to raise capital, like we do routinely every year, we would have done so. As the construction ramps up and we need to pay for the construction, we would raise the necessary capital. Well, Tyler also asked David Ratliff about the Obama administration's new emphasis on nuclear energy and what it means to Southern Company to build the first new U.S. reactor in decades. You can see their entire conversation right here at cleanskies.com. Well, don't call coal ash hazardous waste, so says West Virginia Governor Joe Manchin to the EPA. Manchin is cautioning the White House against what he says is jumping to classify coal ash as hazardous. This as the EPA is expected to propose new federal rules that would designate coal ash, a byproduct of using coal to generate electricity, as a hazardous waste. Manchin says that designation would cause significant economic and environmental damage and is calling for EPA to evaluate the facts about coal ash recycling before making a decision. EPA has been considering whether coal ash should be more strictly regulated since about 1980 when Congress blocked the agency from designating power plant ash as hazardous until a detailed study was finished, which is still ongoing, resulting in no federal standards for coal ash waste disposal. 
Well, more than 70 percent of the coal ash that tumbled into the Emory River when a holding pond collapsed at TVA's Kingston plant has been removed. This is according to a Tennessee environmental official who calls it remarkable at an update of the cleanup that was given to state lawmakers. But while officials say the river is the critical area that needs to be cleared, lawmakers say plenty of coal ash remains on land or is held behind dams to be cleaned out in years to come. TVA claims the remaining ash in the waterway should be dredged out by May. The utility also says it plans to remove the more than 2 million cubic yards that still lie just west of the river in a second phase. That one could take three years. Total cost of the cleanup effort could reach $1.2 billion. Well, foreign interest in U.S. shale gas continues to grow. Now Japanese trading house Mitsui is investing $1.4 billion with Anadarko Petroleum for a 32.5% interest in its Marcellus shale holdings in Pennsylvania. Mitsui will pay all Anadarko development costs this year, 90% in 2011 and 2012. In exchange, it gets rights to shale acreage and may buy up to 32.5% interest in Anadarko's existing wells plus additional acreage. Wall Street Journal says Mitsui plans to spend three to four billion dollars in the coming decade to develop the Marcellus. Mitsui is a major player in the international LNG market. Other multinationals, including Norway's Statoil, France's Total, and Japan's Sumitomo, have all entered similar ventures with U.S. producers. A big lure? The technology developed to tap the shale gas, which can be applied to shale formations around the world. Clean Skies did go in-depth into the global shale story. You can find that right here on the site. Well, top Saudi energy official Mohammed Al Saban says world oil demand could peak in the next decade. He's the chief economic advisor to Saudi oil minister uh, Ali Naimi, and he says his country is working to become a top exporter of alternative energy, especially solar power. The country recently launched its first solar power desalination plant, and Al Saban says oil giant Saudi Aramco is working on a pilot project to inject carbon emissions back into wells to help boost output. The carbon sequestration project, he says, is a sign of Saudi Arabia's commitment to environmentally sound energy development. Dominion Virginia Power says more testing is needed before it fully implements a planned $600 million smart meter program. The utility is right now testing about 7,000 smart meters in Chesterfield County near Richmond, 48,000 meters also in the Charlottesville Albemarle County area. Officials say they want to expand that test and install another 30,000 smart meters in parts of northern Virginia. Dominion says the expansion will confirm results of the current testing and address concerns raised before the state corporation Commission. The utility expects the system will help customers cut down on electricity use through improved energy delivery. When it's fully phased in, the automated meters would replace all 2.4 million electric meters that Dominion Virginia Power customers now use. Well, while Olympic athletes go for the gold, the Canadian government is going for the green. Canada's Environment Minister Jim Prentice says the country is investing $150,000 in carbon reduction initiatives to offset about 7,600 tons of emissions created by thousands of government employees involved in the Olympic Games. Other initiatives include environmental assessments of venue sites to reduce the Games' ecological footprint, the British Columbia Hydrogen Highway Project, showcasing hydrogen and fuel cell technology. Also, the wave roof of the Richmond Oval Track, made from wood recycled from trees destroyed by pine beetles. Let's take a look now at some energy goings on around the Beltway today. At 8 a.m., that Narook winter meeting continues at the Washington Renaissance Hotel. EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson is supposed to give remarks there, and Clean Skies News is there. 9.30, the Center for Strategic International Studies, CSIS, Energy and National Security Program has a discussion on green stimulus one year later, featuring a keynote address by David Sandalow. He's an Assistant Secretary of Energy for Policy and International Affairs. Clean Skies News will be there. At noon, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Administrator Jane Lubchenco leads a press conference to talk about NOAA's fiscal year 2011 budget that's happening at the National Press Club. That is the Energy Report. Thanks for joining us here in the Energy News Center. For any suggestions or comments, about our programming here on Clean Skies News. We want to hear from you. You can email us at contact at cleanskies.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook, too. I'm Susan McGinnis. You're watching Clean Skies News.